The Lord be with you. I invite you to join with me in turning in your copy of God's Word to the 18th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 18, we'll be reading verses 1 through 8 this morning. Luke chapter 18, verse 1 reads, Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who carry, cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray you give us ears to hear your words. While whatever words I may place in the way, Lord, are quickly forgotten. And yours remain, changing us more and more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You ever been pushing your buggy? That's what we call it. I didn't know people didn't call it that, by the way. You know, some folks call them carts, but buggies. Pushing your buggy down the aisle at Winn-Dixie or Walmart or wherever. And you come up on a mother and her child. Mom is there with a grocery list, milk, bread, eggs, sugar. But the child right next to her sees something on the shelf and is captivated by it. Doesn't really matter what it is. It, it could be a, a bag of candy. It could be a box of cereal. It could be one of those little frustrating things they sell at grocery stores like green squirt guns or pink foam footballs. We don't eat those. Why do they sell them at the grocery store? But he sees them, his eyes fixed on them, tugs at mom's shirt sleeve right at the elbow. Mama, hey, hey, mama, can I have that? Mama doesn't even look up. No, no, child, you can't have that. That's what we call phase one. <laughs> phase two goes a little, little differently. Uh, child re rethinks his strategy, tugs on mama's shirt sleeve. Mama, mama, Please, can I have that? Or they say this, pretty please, which this is, just, this is just free. You can write this down. I don't know where we got the idea that making a please, a please pretty makes any difference. I've never seen an ugly please myself. But he says, and I can't fault the kid for that. I mean, I had parents, grandparents, you did too. Maybe you're one of them. Child comes to you. Can I have that? And what do you say? What's the magic word? My sister always thought it was now. <laughs> But no, no, it's, it's, please, mama, please, can I have that? Mom's counting the cabbage and the potatoes, the tomatoes and the buggy. No, child, you can't have that. That's phase two. Phase three is different depending on the child, but they all start kind of the same. They're sort of standing at attention, teeth clenched, mouth closed, and it starts out subtle. And it gets a little, the mouth open, and then a bounce starts somewhere about the ankles. It starts sort of getting up, going up the body, comes into the hips, and it's in the shoulders. And before you know it, a once upright child is flat on the floor. The feet are kicking, the hands are flailing. Somebody way over in the dairy case has dropped a half a gallon of buttermilk. What was that? And they're crying. I want it. I want it. Mama, I want it. It's not fair. Everything in the world has suddenly stopped. 
Nothing is right with the world anymore. There will never be peace again. The sun will never come up again. It will never rain again or the sun will never shine again. Everything is wrong and bad and it won't go right again until that child gets that little squirt gun. Or that bag of, or that bag of dried apricots or something. They don't even know what it is. They just want it. And this is risky. It's risky for the child. Because I remember when I was a kid going to the grocery store with Grandma, my cousin David pitched a fit one time. Grandma left the buggy there. We walked around to the back of Winn-Dixie. There were catawba trees. She pulled a branch out of one. David cried a little bit more, but not because he didn't get what he wanted. <laughs> it's risky. It's risky for the parent. Because you know what happens. You think the same thing. Walking down, the, I wish they'd shut that kid up. I can't decide what kind of bushes baked beans I want. Or you're on the other side. You know, it's just a dollar. Buy the little squirt gun for the squirt. It doesn't matter. Get it for him. Shut him up. The workers are stocking the shelf somewhere else. I wish they'd hush that kid. I see it all the time. I know what it would take. It's risky. Good parents, which I may not be one, we usually pick the child up, console them, comfort them, teach them some of life's simple lessons like Mr. Rogers would, sit them in the buggy, and off they go down the aisle. But most often what happens is we look around, see everybody looking at us, go, all right, here, here, you can hold it while we're in the store. But it has to go back when we check out. And somehow it finds its way across the scanner, then the car. Sometimes I think that's how we think about God. It starts out subtly. We just tug on his, on his shirt sleeve. God, God, I, I've got to go to the dock today for a test. If you could, I mean, if it doesn't, if, 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 if it's your will, make sure it's okay. We just sort of tug. And then the doctor calls us. I, I need you to come back in. There was something abnormal. Something wasn't quite right. And our language changes. Please, God, don't let it be cancer. Don't let it be this. Doc calls us back, I'm afraid, I'm afraid it's bad. And then we start throwing fits. Why, God, it's not fair. I go to church every Sunday, I go to Sunday school, I say my prayers, I give my tithe, it's not fair. And we pitch a fit. And we pray, and we pray, and we pray, and we hope that God will just give in. Okay, child, hush, hush. Some of us think about God that way when we read a parable like this. And then there are times we think of God like an addict sitting at the slot machine. Oh, oh, you, they, they, you think it works by sitting back and sort of calculating, watching as people go up to it, sitting in the casino lobby all day, watching as they come up and feed the machine quarters, pull the lever, you watch the clock and you say, okay, in three hours, this many people came, they put in this many quarters, they pulled the lever this many times, and this is when they won. It's a simple, simple algorithm, a simple formula, but that's not how they do it. They sit there with their cup, their bucket of coins, one at a time, feed the machine, pull the lever, rolls around. Cherry, cherry, lemon. I was close. Coin goes back in. Cherry, lemon. Orange. Uh, that's just a fluke. Let me try again. And they put it in and over. And they sit there for hours until they realize their mind starts playing tricks on them. You know what it is? I need to put the quarter in the machine and count to three. And then pull the lever. Clink. One, two, three. Boom. Cherry. Cherry. Orange. I pulled it too fast. Clink. One, two, three. Again. And then they come up with all kinds of reasons. I should spin the quarter as I put it in. I should wait to five. I should pull it slow. I should pull it fast. It doesn't matter. The mind begins to play tricks. We do this sometimes, I think, when we read this parable. It's how we think about God. We pray, and we, when something doesn't go our way, oh, we're not praying the right way. So you go in the guest bedroom. You clean out the closet. You take all the coats out, put the Christmas tree somewhere else. You stick a kitchen chair in the corner a little table, a little candle, a Gideon New Testament. Every morning you go in, you shut the door and you pray. Every night before you go to bed, you shut the door and you pray and nothing happens. And someone says, oh, you're not doing it right. Maybe you should go to the altar. That's the steps on the chancel. Get down on the altar. That'll change things. So you come down and you kneel on the steps and you pray and your face is wet with tears and nothing changes. Someone says, oh, what you need to do, you need to get that prayer of Jabez. That'll work. 
prosperity dribble stuff. You try that, it doesn't work. I said, well, what you need to do is go out in the woods, sit at the base of a big oak tree, stretch your hands out to the sky, and pray for three hours. You try it. It doesn't work. That's what we do. We think sometimes it's about just getting the combination right, just doing the things right. That may be one day. That's what it is. We're praying so much. Jesus is trying to teach us. Just keep praying until you figure out the right way. But that's not what it's about. And then sometimes I think we see God like a big car dealer in Texas. Now, I say Texas because I don't, I don't remember, I haven't heard of anyone doing this in Alabama. But in Texas, every once in a while, you'd hear on the radio or you'd see on the TV, the Nissan dealer, the Chevy dealer, somebody is having what they call a hands on a hard body contest. Y'all ever heard of these? What it would do is you'd come out, out to the dealer on Saturday, sign a little waiver, and then when the whistle blew, you stuck your hand on the car and you didn't move. And the last one with their hand on the car, guess what? They got the car. They got to keep the car. Oh, there were potty breaks. There were times to go eat lunch, those sorts of things. But, but they would keep their hands on the car. And it always went about the same way. The first folks who came just as looky-loos, about 30 minutes in, ah, I got better things to do than this, take their hands off, disqualified, and go away. But the hours would go by. And sometimes it was silly things. Somebody would yawn, oh, oh, and they pulled both hands off the car. Sometimes people would trick them. They'd have their left hand on the car, watch on the hand. What time is it? Oh, I don't, oh you got me. But eventually, when it got right down to it, there are two or three. They're always the same kind of people. Hands on the car, been standing there for hours. I need this. I need a mark in the wind column. Wife left me, took the kids. I need this. Other person's over there, oh, yeah, I need it too. Dad, Dad had a stroke. He's got to move in with us, so we can't afford a U-Haul. I need this truck to bring him in. I need the truck to move him in. And they're all the same. Hands on the truck. I think we think that way about God sometimes when we read this. That the point of persevering is to just hang on until we beat someone else out. The farmer sitting in his field, dry as a bone, praying for rain. And across town in a barn, a couple praying that it won't rain because it'll ruin the wedding pictures. Who's going to win? That's what we think. Who's going to outlast the other one? That's not God. That's not what this parable is about. Jesus tells the story, Luke tells us, so that the, the disciples may remember to pray always and not lose heart. And he tells this story about a judge who doesn't give a lick about anybody, including God. He comes in in the morning, coffee in hand, sits it on the desk, puts on his robe, goes and sits in the courtroom, tells the bailiff, bring them in, bring them in. The gavel falls every time. Guilty, guilty, guilty. I got things to do. Let's move it along. Guilty, guilty. Goes back into his chamber, takes the robe off, hangs it on the hook, and then on the door. Your Honor, it's me, Widow Jones, just wondering when you're going to hear my, my case. I'll get around to it the next day. Your Honor, it's me, Widow Jones. When are you going to get to my case? Every single day, she's there tapping on the glass on the office door. Mr. Your Honor, Your Honor, it's me. It's me, Widow Jones. When are you going to hear my case? When are you going to hear my case? Finally, we think when we read the parable, it says if he gets fed up with it, tells him, bring her file in here. Just stamp it. Get her out of here. I'm tired of hearing her. The Greek says he wants to get her out of there before she comes and slaps him in the face. That's what it says. Get her out of here. I don't want to fool with her. Just get here. I'll rubber stamp it, sign whatever I need to sign. Just get her out of here. That's what we think it means. And so we take that back and say, well, if we just pester God enough, he'll give us what we want. Just hang in there. Just keep coming every day, knocking on the door, knocking on the door. Eventually, God will give in. But that's not what the passage says. That's not what it's about. Jesus says that this unjust judge gives this widow justice. She is persistent. And he says, if this judge who doesn't give a lick about anybody would do that, how much more then would your God, who loves you more than you can understand, who has chosen you, how much more will he not delay in giving you justice? Now there's a problem with that word, justice. It's sticky. Because sometimes, most times maybe, 
Justice isn't what we want. Justice isn't what we want. For those of us who live on this side of the line that divides the world in half, we don't want justice because justice erases that line. For those of us on on this side of privilege and comfort, we don't want justice because sometimes, most times, justice erases those lines of privilege and comfort. We don't want justice. We don't really want justice. We want what we want. To pray for justice is to pray for what God wants. And that may be it. Because if this isn't about bothering God until he gives in, what is it about? If it's not about pestering God, what is it about? I think it's about a fate that pesters us. It reminds me of one of those stories I used to hear in Bible school and Sunday school. Three friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, big, big wig in his time, had built this big statue, told everybody, all right, when we sound the alarm, when we play the music, everybody bows down, everybody worships. If you don't, you'll be sorry. Only three people didn't, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They bring him in, and Nebuchadnezzar doesn't even care. He just tells them, look, I don't care who you worship, just worship this statue. You're making me look bad. Just do it. And I love the way the writer of Daniel says it. He says that Nebuchadnezzar had a furnace prepared that was so hot that if you even got close to it, you were consumed by the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar tells them, he says, all right, you got one more chance. When the music plays, you bow down and worship or I'm throwing you in there. And I love what they say next. All three of them in unison say, you can throw us in the fire, but our God will deliver us. And it's great if you leave it right there, but it's even better if you keep reading because they say, but even if he doesn't, he's still our God and you're not. Maybe that's what this is a parable about. Or about when the disciples came to Jesus. Lord, teach us how to pray. Show us how to pray. John's disciples, John told them how to pray. Teach us. Jesus says, well, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's what he said. Not give us what we want. Your will be done. It was like when he was just a few chapters after this one. He's there in the garden. Luke says he was was in such agony. His sweat was like great drops of blood falling from his face. Lord, if it's your will, let this cup of suffering pass from me, but not my will, yours. Maybe that's what it's about. Not a faith that that is so persistent and pestering that it's all the time, all we're doing is praying and praying, God, give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this, make this happen, over and over and over again. But maybe it's about a faith that pesters us to the point where every time we close our eyes, every time we bow our heads, every time we're in a place like this, we cannot help but think of God's will being done in the world. That we cannot help but be consumed by God's coming kingdom and lay aside everything that we want and desire because it's not about our will, but God's. Maybe that's why Jesus says, listen to the unjust judge. He gives this widow mercy and grants her justice and will not God do the same thing? The answer is, of course, yes, we know God will. And so Jesus says, but when the Son of Man comes, will he even find faith on earth? Because, folks, we come to rooms like this and times like this and we profess a faith in a God who we trust can do all things. And then we go out into a world and are silent. And we go out into a place where there is need and there is longing and there is need for justice. And we're quiet. We're silent. And Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, will he even find faith on earth? I wonder if he'll even find faith in me. Will he find faith in you? Let's pray.
Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we proclaim our trust in you, as we say with our mouths and with our hearts, Lord, that we trust you to bring justice to the world, to bring your kingdom to this world, for your will to be done. Help us, Lord, to live that each day. As our will diminishes, may your will be made greater in our lives, and may you give us the strength and the power to bring it about. Lord, as we are persistent and long-suffering in our prayers to you, remind us, Lord, that you are persistent and long-suffering in your faith in us to do what you would call us to do. So, Lord Christ, be with us in this time. May your Holy Spirit move in our presence. Provoke us, Lord, to make decisions that will not only change our lives, but the lives of others, and, Lord, even the whole world. In your holy name we pray. Amen.